All right. If you'd please turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 19 this morning. Psalm 19. I will uh, be reading the entire psalm, but just preaching on one verse this morning, verse 7. But I'll begin reading here with verse 1, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit from unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yet gold, yea, much more than fine gold, sweeter also than the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? And cleanse thou me from thy secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. This week I came across a list, a list of bloopers and typos written in church bulletins, of which I will share just a few with you this morning. The first, the outreach committee has enlisted 25 visitors to make calls on people who are not afflicted with any church. During the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good sermon from the Reverend E.J. Stubbs. Next Sunday, Miss Vincent will be the soloist for the morning service. The pastor will then speak on It's a Terrible Experience. <laughs> then one church sign said, Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> uh, Thursday at 5 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. All ladies wishing to become Little Mothers will meet with the pastor in his study. The Low Self-Esteem Support Group will meet Thursday at 7 to 8.30. Please use the back door of the church. And then we'll end with this one. Jean has been leading a weight management series Wednesday nights at 7. She uses the program herself and has been growing like crazy. <laughs> Aren't we glad, aren't we glad that although we live in a world marred with imperfection, and marked with mistakes, imperfect bulletins, imperfect church secretaries, imperfect pastors, and imperfect people that God has not only given to us, but preserved unto us something that is absolutely perfect. The very word of God. Psalm 19.7 said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. A few months ago, I preached a sermon entitled Seven Obligations Which Every Christian Has to the Scriptures. And today, upon the occasion of having the Gideons here, I thought I would supplement that sermon. Not to talk about the obligations which you have to Scripture, but instead to encourage you to those obligations by talking briefly about the benefits that the Scriptures offer to us. Now, they are manifold, and we could talk about seemingly innumerable benefits which the scriptures speak to us, but I would like to look just at one or two that, that verse 7 suggests to us this morning. And I really want to ask ourselves, do we really appreciate the scriptures? We give money to the Gideons, and we appreciate their stories, and all the work that they do, all the while that our Bible usually sits on the shelf, not being read, 
and certainly not being listened to and obeyed. The year 2017 will mark a very important anniversary in Western society. It was in October 31st, 1517, that the German monk Martin Luther went to the castle door of the church in Wittenberg and nailed there his 95 theses, and that started the Protestant Reformation. And central to that Reformation was the idea that the people ought to have the Bible because they need the Bible. Martin Luther said this, the Bible is the proper book for men. There the truth is distinguished from error far more clearly than anywhere else. For 28 years since I became a doctor, I have now constantly read and preached the Bible. And yet I have not exhausted it, but I find something new in it every day. That's true. The scriptures bring forth new truth each and every day. As a matter of fact, each and every time they are read. So let's look this morning just briefly here for a few minutes of some of the benefits that we can receive from the scriptures that Psalm 19 verse 7 tells us about. The psalmist says in the first line, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. This is the first benefit. And this is the greatest benefit that the scripture offers anyone. The word of God will convert you. And only the word of God can convert you. What's interesting is the psalmist sets up a contrast between the first half of the verse here and the second half of the verse. In the first half of the verse, he talks about general revelation, that truth that God displays to us through creation. And in the second half of the passage here, he tells us about special revelation, the truth that God reveals to us when he speaks truth to us through the prophets, through the apostles, and now especially through his word. And he compares and contrasts these two types of revelation. And he finds three similarities here. The first similarity in verse 1 of Psalm 19 is he says that the truth of God that we receive through general revelation is profound. As a matter of fact, he says it's glorious. He says the heavens declare the glory of God. Why do the heavens declare the glory of God? Look around us. We see all the beauty of the universe, all the beauty of the trees and the rivers and the stars and the sun, all the beauty of all the creation that we see around us. And why is it so beautiful? Because it reflects the character and nature of God. We see the beauty in creation and realize that God is beautiful. We see the power in creation and realize that God is powerful. We see justice and fear in creation and realize that God is just and is God is a God who ought to be feared. First principle, he tells us, is that his revelation is profound. The second thing is that he tells us his revelation is that it's pervasive. We see this in verse 2. He says, day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. You can't go a day without observing the world around you and see God's handiwork in it. It's revealed in everything you see, regardless of how much the atheist has to go out of his way to deny it. The universe has a simplicity and a complexity about it that's inexplicable apart from God. Everything you see in this universe testifies his creation. Whether it's from the human eye to the universe to the solar system or the fact that we can talk and speak. These are all representations that God is wise. And all of them speak to the truth that God has revealed the fact that he is glorious and that he is just and beautiful. So we know that revelation is profound, it is pervasive, and then also it's persuasive. Verse 3, there is no speak, speech or language where their voice is not heard. God says all of these things ought to be enough to you to realize that there is a creator. It's undeniable. It's meant to be persuasive. But you know what? It's not, is it? If we could simply look at creation and realize that there is a God and he's a good God and a just God and a God to be feared, then everyone would be saved, but everyone's not saved. Matter of fact, many deny that revelation. And the reason for that is because this revelation lacks one thing. And it's one thing that only special revelation has. It's one thing that we only find in the Bible, and that's found in verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's complete. You see, we can guess at the nature of God and the beauty of God by seeing the world around us. But you could never guess the gospel 
by just observing creation. You could never guess the fact that Jesus came to die for your sins just by looking at the sun, moon, and stars. That's a truth that can only come from God speaking these things to you and the truth that he's revealed through the prophets and the apostles. That's why the psalmist says the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect because it's complete. It's everything that you and I need to know God and in order to be reconciled to God. Romans 3 Chapters, uh, verses 11, 10 through 11 says, As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seek after God. Man in his own capacity will never find his own way to God, but instead it's always God that finds man. You can contemplate the stars as much as you wish, and you won't be saved. You can observe society, and you won't guess on the truth of justification by faith alone. That's something that God only reveals to us through the scriptures. And that's what makes this book so very important. Because it's only through this book that you and I will get saved. And you know what? It's only by sharing this book with others that your friends and your family and the people in your community will be saved. It's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Falsely, I should say, that he said, preach the gospel always and use words if necessary. Probably the stupidest statement I've ever heard, and it wasn't actually said by him anyway. Nowhere is it recorded. Now, there's a little bit of truth in that, but there's a whole lot of falsehood. If people are going to be saved, it won't come from just observing your life or your works or creation. They'll only get saved when you share the gospel with them. When you tell them about Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers. When you tell them that their mind is warped and they need to trade the lies of Satan for the truth of God. Romans chapter 10 verses 14 and following says, How then shall they call in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Ladies and gentlemen, it's the responsibility of every Christian to share the gospel with those around them. Because one of the benefits of the Bible is that it will bring about conversion. And without it, no one will be converted. But that's certainly not the only benefit we receive. Not only does the Bible convert you, it also transforms you. That's what we see in the second half of verse 7. Here the psalmist says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Thank God that when we're converted, he doesn't leave us as we are. He makes us a new creature at the time of conversion, but then he continues to transform us day by day, hour by hour, week by week. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Creature, all things, old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You see, a great deal of things happen at your conversion, but a great deal of things also must happen afterwards. And if you aren't a different person from when you were before you were saved, you really need to take a look at your life and see what's wrong. If you're not a different person, a stronger Christian, a more mature believer this year than you were last year, you need to take a look at the scriptures and see what it says about that. Because you are a new creature and you will continue to be made and remade in God's image. And that doesn't happen by chance. It only happens when you hear and read the word of God. It's only the Word of God that will transform you. And if this isn't happening to you, and it hasn't happened to you, you need to get things right with God. It's only through the Scriptures that we'll see our relationships changed. It's only through the Scriptures that you'll see your spirit enlivened. It's only through the Scriptures that you'll see your priorities rearranged. It's only through reading the Bible that you'll see your thought patterns rearranged and made new. It's only through the scriptures that your character will be changed. And it's only through the scriptures that the scars and the suffering that you see in your soul will be healed. Yes, God does this by bringing you not just to the scriptures as a means in and of themselves, because they are designed to bring you to God 
himself. And he's the one that changes you. And the only way that you'll be brought close to him and conform to his image is through the Holy Spirit working through this Bible here. Turn with me to Proverbs chapters 1 verses 4 through 7. For Solomon, a very wise man, says this. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Excuse me, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, and to give subtlety to the simple. That's what you and I need. As baby Christians starting out converted, we are simple, we're ignorant, we're fools. And we need to know God. We need to learn his truth. We need to exchange our self-reliance for reliance on God. We need to change our dependency on what truth we believe in and we've been taught from the world under the truth of God. And it will only come when we understand that the testimony of the Lord is sure, which will make wise the simple. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the mind once stretched by a new idea never returns to its original dimensions. That's true, not just about new ideas, but especially about new truths we find in scriptures. Confronting truth will change you. Every time you read the Bible, you should expect to be changed. Every time you listen to a sermon or hear the Bible read yourself or reading it yourself, you should expect to be transformed. Not a lot, but a little. You should find that the truth there and speaks to you and it tells us what we're doing wrong and what we need to do to make things right. Truth changes us, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. But the Word of God will always change you. And you won't be changed unless you understand the value of the Word of God and how it brings you to God, gives you a knowledge of Him, and conforms you to His desire and uh, will for you. Those are the things that the Bible does for us. It converts us and it transforms us. And I'd like to just share a few words of application of what we need to do with all this. You and I well know that there are things in our lives that don't line up with this book. If you say, no, that's not the case, then you're a liar, because I know it's about true about me, and I know it's true about you. So what do we do with that? Well, let's take a little bit of advice here from the Old Testament book of Job. A little bit of advice from Zophar the Namahite. And now if someone named Zophar tries to give you advice, you'll probably not want to take it. But we'll take uh, advice here from this guy named Zophar. Job chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. He says, If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy faith, face without spot, Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and not fear. Zophar tells you and me to prepare our hearts and to stretch out our hands towards God. How do we do that? How do we prepare our hearts? Well, ladies, how do you do that? If you have a picnic coming up or a reunion, what do you do to prepare the meal? Well, first you get the recipe, right? You get all your ingredients together. You heat the oven up and then you put all those two things together, hopefully in the right way, and hope whatever comes out of that oven is edible. Well, that's what it means for us to prepare our hearts. We get all the ingredients together. We find out what the Bible says about our issues, our problems, our relationships. And then we try to put those things together and bake them in the light of the Holy Spirit. And that will prepare something in our hearts that will result in hopefully a harvest of righteousness, something that will satisfy and build up our soul. You and I, when we have problems in our life, which we all do, when you have issues, when you have relationship uh, issues which need to be dealt with, we do this. We prepare our heart. We look in the Bible and see how it addresses what's going on. We memorize those scriptures. We meditate upon it, we pray about it, and then we practice it and ask God to help us practice it even more. That's what it means to pray, uh, to prepare our hearts, and to stretch out 
our arms to God. And you and I need to do this, not just once in a while, but we need to do it in a serious and a systematic way all the days of our lives. That's how mature, solid, stable Christians are made. Let me ask you a tough question this morning. How many times, or how long has it been, since you really had a conversation in your home about your relationship with God, with you and your family? How long has it been since you had family worship? Since you opened the Bible after dinner time, took a passage of scripture, and discussed it uh, with your family? It's not easy to do. It doesn't happen too often. But the Bible says the Christians must do it. You must do it in your families. You must do it in your churches. You must do it as an individual. Open the Bible. Discuss it. See what it has for you. Once you start to do that, you'll see your life transformed. You'll see your family transformed. We'll see this church transformed. The Bible and only the Bible will change, nurture, and sustain you. Many of you probably uh, here probably grew up on farms or at least are familiar with what farm life is like. You know that farm life can sometimes be hard and heartbreaking, especially when you lose animals, and especially when they're young. This uh, past Saturday, or Saturday before last, was kind of a, a hard day on the Kunzelman farm. We lost not only a chick, but also a calf on the same day. The calf was especially a difficult case because it had been around a while, but these are the realities of farm life. You usually use a cat, lose a calf every other year or so. But what's odd about this particular calf is usually we lose them when uh, the pregnancy goes badly or even the birth goes badly. And sometimes we lose them uh, because the mother is inadequate, can't produce enough milk or for whatever reason doesn't show any interest in the calf. But this calf was very different. The pregnancy, the birth was just fine. Uh, the calf was born healthy and well. The mother was very doting and she gave plenty of milk for the calf. But the strange thing was, despite the fact that this calf looked perfectly healthy, it showed no interest in its mother. No interest whatsoever. She would move for it. She would lick it. She would take care of it. A very good mother. But the calf, for whatever reason, just showed no interest in the cow for whatever reason whatsoever. It would go off on its own. It would just lay there when she moved to it. No interest whatsoever. And it would only eat when it was forced to be fed. We even tried bottle feeding it for a while. But yet, it just withered away and eventually died the week before last. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's the case of so many Christians out there. We have everything we need to be mature, stable, strong Christians. The problem isn't in the Word of God. The problem isn't in our pastors so much. Uh, the problem isn't in our fellow Christians. The problem certainly isn't in our Bible studies or our Sunday schools. As long as we're being faithful to the Word of God and all we do, we have everything we need. So often the problem is in us. We really have no desire for the pure milk of the Word and the strong meat of the Scriptures which we so much need. Strong truth that will transform my life and your life. In Matthew 22, verse 29, Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees, or more appropriately, they were arguing with him. And the reason they were doing that is because they were simply treating the scriptures as a novelty. They weren't really seriously uh, considering applying it to their lives. And Jesus said unto them, Jesus said, Do ye err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God? Ladies and gentlemen, there is power in this book. All the power that you and I need to live godly in Christ Jesus. All the power we need to convert and transform our families, our society, and our community. We simply need a hunger for it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful for your word that even instructs us this morning. Give us a desire for your word. Give us a taste of the good things of God. Lord, transform us, convict us of our sins, and encourage us in you. Lord, we just ask that you might help us to be more faithful Christians. Help us to be faithful in our own lives, and in our family life, and in our church life. Lord, help us to open our eyes to see all that you have for us in these very scriptures. When we finally read them, memorize them, meditate them,
and practice them. Lord, we ask that this would be done, and we ask that it would be done by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that through it, we might give all glory to you and all that you do through us. For it's in Jesus Christ, the truth's name we pray. Amen. Let's close our service by singing hymn number 281, What a Wonderful Change in My Life. Hymn number 281, please stand.